أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير <تصفيق> الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فارجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب اليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا بمصابيح وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين وجعلناها رجوما الشياطين وأعتدنا لهم عذاب السعير وللذين كفروا بربهم عذاب جهنم وبئس المصير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما طحاها ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها 
كذبت ثمود بطغواها إذ بعث أشقاها فقال لهم رسول الله ناقة الله وسقيا فكذبوه فعقروها فدمدم عليهم ربهم بذنبهم فسواها ولا يخاف عقباها صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وعز المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد أبي القاسم محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين نبقى الآن مع كلمة لسماحة الشيخ أوس أصفر في التي فضل مصحوبا مأجورا بركة الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد صلوا على محمد وآل محمد صلي على محمد وآل محمد ثانية على حب الحسن والحسين صلي على محمد وآل محمد ثالثة على حب فاطمة الزهراء بعلى على أصواتكم In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon our Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his infallible progeny and may Allah's eternal damnation be upon their enemies from now until the end of time. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran in the chapter of Al-Baqarah verses 155 to 157. He says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ أَلَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Three long verses. I will translate them right now. Don't worry. Okay? Right. So the first verse says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, He says, And surely we will try you, test you, with some fear, right? With some hunger, right? So you'll feel fear, fear and hunger. وَنَقْصٍ and deficiency فِي الْأَمْوَالِ in wealth وَالْأَنفُسِ in health والثمرات in prosperity and bear glad tidings to those who are patient, 
Who are they? الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون. Those are the ones whom, when struck by a calamity, say, "Surely we are from Allah, our Creator, God, and to He we shall return." And if they do so, Allah continues. He says, "أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة." So these are the ones that say. Oh, these are the ones that say what? These are the ones that say, surely we are from Allah and to He we shall return. If we want to know who the Sabareen are, Allah says. The patient ones are the ones who say, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Surely we are from Allah and we, to He we shall return. And the result of that is, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ Upon them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bestow His praise and his mercy, and they will be the ones who will be known as the righteously guided. Sadaq Allahu al-Ali al-Azim. Amanna billah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you give a people uh, salutations, then they must return it in the same, in the like, or better. So I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahsan to barakatullahi alaikum. So today I chose to speak about the topic of struggle. Now, this week marks a very important week for us who are of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, as it marks the, um, the days of the martyrdom of Imam al Hassan al Askari, the father of Imam al Hujjah. Ajallah ta'ala farajahu sharif the savior of humanity, Imam al-Mahdi, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. And it also marks the crowning, if you will, of Imam al-Hujjah as the reigning Imam from the time of the death of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari until our time. So this marks a very important period in which we should really learn a lot about our Imam, uh, learn a lot about uh, Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, try to understand why we're here and what their roles are. But in order to do so, we must understand first and foremost the concept of struggle. Because you see, after the death of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, the entire Muslim nation entered an era of struggle, a different kind of struggle. It wasn't that the struggle was just one that was similar to each one of the other Imam's eras, but rather, it was a time now in which we can expect a lesser occultation and a greater occultation, in which the Imam is not easily accessible to us, where we can just go and visit him and talk to him and ask him questions or direct our concerns to him. And so the concept of struggle becomes very important to us, understanding how to deal with struggle. So, and that's why I chose the verses that I chose today. Since it is Sunday, right? Um, everybody's winding down and getting ready for Monday, right? The beginning of the week. And we want to start with a lot of energy, right? This upcoming week. And in order to do so, what we have to do is kind of pump ourselves up, right? For a positive week, a really good week, even though it is a sad week, right? It is also the week in which Al Imam Al Hujjah, sallallahu wa sallam, was officially crowned to be the Imam of his time, right? So this is truly, it should really be a great week. But in order to navigate through this week and the rest of our lives, we have to understand the concept of struggle and we have to understand it well. So in order to do so, what I want to do is I want to look at three main points. The first is I want to understand the concept of struggle in our lives, right? And I, and I really want to deal with it from a more rational, intellectual perspective, right? And then secondly, I want to see what the halls of academia say about the concept of struggle. I mean, have social psychologists dealt with the issue of social struggle or not? And what have they found? And finally, what does the Holy Quran tell us about struggle? And how can I apply that practically to my everyday life, right? Because at the end of the road, there's no point of you know, learning about the Qur'an unless I can really apply it to my everyday life, right? So, let's get started. Now, always in any intellectual discourse, what we have to do is always establish a baseline, a foundation upon which we're going to base every single thought after that. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to realize that struggle always starts within, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to look within. 
So I look within myself, what do I find? I find that I'm limited, right? I find that I don't always have the solutions to everything. I'm limited in my height, I'm limited in my strength, I'm limited in my eyesight. I'm limited in that I need to feel happy, right? I'm limited in simple things such as I need to go to the bathroom, right? I'm limited. And I know that my parents are limited when I look towards them, even though they created me, right? So even a creator, right, of other human beings such as parents, can also be limited. Why? Because they're similar to me. They're humans like me, right? I look at their grandparents, my jiddo and my sitto, and what do I find? I find they're limited too, as great as they are, right? As loving as they are, as supportive as they are, but I still find that they're limited, right? And I ask myself, well, what created this limited world, right? When I ask myself that question, and all of us ask ourselves this question, right, Khodor? At one time, I have to ask myself this question. Who created this limited world, right? So, when I look at myself, I know it couldn't be me because I don't have all the information. I'm limited. I look towards my parents. What do I find? I find they're limited too. I look beyond them, right, towards the surroundings. I find everything is limited at the very least by space and time. So everything, therefore, in this universe is limited. I know that in concepts such as the contracting universe or the expanding universe, the fact that it contracts or expands implies that it is defined. And if it's defined, that means it has limits, right? So everything in this world then has limits. So I think about things that are created because I want to know who created this world. So when I think about things that, I, that are created, what do I find? I find, for example, everybody ate of an usha today, right? right. So when the baker made them an usha, were they inside the manusha that they baked when they baked it? If you say yes, that means you're all cannibals and you ate the person who made the manusha for you. <laughs> you have to say no. <laughs> right? So the creator of an engine, since you know, we're in uh, you know, car town here, right? Um, the creator of an engine, an engineer, is he inside the engine that he creates when he creates it? No. Right? Otherwise he'd be shredded to pieces. Right? So that tells us then, right, that just like a painter isn't inside the paint of a painting that he paints, right? Does that make sense to say? Yeah. Then that means then that the creator of something can't be inside that thing that they create when they create it. Make sense? Now, what about this world, this world of limitation? I ask you. Who is the ultimate creator of the world of limitation? And based on that concept that we just agreed upon, right? Is he limited or is he unlimited? He has to be, I heard it, he has to be unlimited. Right? In the first place, he couldn't be inside the world that he created, that he created when he created it. Why? Because it had to be created anyway. Right? He's got to create it first. So he has to be in the realm of what? Of limitation or an unlimited realm. Unlimited existence, right? Where nothing else exists except for him. He is the unlimited creator, the ultimate creator of all things. Got it? There's the baseline. We got it? Now, if he is unlimited, which we just proved. Did we just prove he's unlimited or no? Yes. That means if you're unlimited, do you have any flaws? Do you have any flaws? Do you have any limitations? Then you are what? You are perfect, right? If you're unlimited, then you're what? Perfect, exactly. So if you're perfect, do you oppress? Do you hurt other people? Are you unwise or are you all wise? Are you unjust or are you all just? All just, right? There's the baseline, got it? Now, now we start the rational discourse. We didn't even start yet, okay? That's the baseline. Now, we said that everything in this world is limited, right? How do we know? Because we see things are created and things die, right? So everything in this world, because it's limited, it has a beginning and an end, correct? Everything in this world has a beginning and an end. So the struggles you go through in this world, the trials and tribulations that you go through, have a beginning and then, 
What? An end. Right? The struggles within the trials have a beginning and end. And the pain within the struggle has a beginning and end. And so that helps me then realize that you know what? My trials, my struggles, my pain has a beginning and an end. Now that's very important. Why? And I want you to set that aside, right? If it has a beginning and an end, and God, we said, is all perfect, and if He's all perfect, He's all purposeful, then the struggles that are created within this world have a purpose, right? Got it? Now, is the purpose just the struggle or what is beyond the struggle? Because the struggle has a beginning and an end. Huh? Ahsanti. It could be within and more importantly, it's beyond. How do I know this? Let me give you a simple example. How many people here take exams? Tests? In school? Right? Good. Let me ask you, do you get rewarded while you're taking the test? No. You don't get rewarded while you're taking the test. The only reward you feel is a sense of satisfaction, contentment if you were well prepared to take your test. Am I right or no? Yes. Right? right? But that's not the real reward, right? The real reward comes when? Comes after you passed all of these beautiful, great tests, right? Beautiful and great because you prepared for them. Not so great if you didn't prepare for them, right? Right? If you crammed. Or crammed so much that you slept through the exam. That, that happened to one of my friends in high school, unfortunately. So, what happens then is that now I understand that, you know what, the real reward isn't inside the test itself. The real reward comes after. Is it when I get my grade, specifically the results that the reward occurs? Or is it when I get that diploma, my high school diploma, or my bachelor's degree, or my master's degree, or my PhD, right? And then what starts? My real life begins after that, right? That's when, you know, I start working and I start a family, right, Haj Hassan, right? right? That's when I see the fruits of my labor, right? The real reward is not in the test. The real reward comes after the test. So if the tests in this world have a beginning and an end, then the real rewards come when? Come after the tests, right? And if this world has a beginning and, and an end, and it's full of tests, then you know what? This world is an ultimate test. So the real reward comes when? Within this life, in this world, or after? After. And the graduation ceremony is when? is on the day of judgment when when you know all not all the te all the test scores are tallied those you get your results and then you're like you're waiting okay do i graduate don't i graduate right which level do i graduate to you see there's an intellectual necessity for a reality that is beyond this limited world if i just look at simple concepts within my daily life I come to realize realities that are beyond what is seen in this world. You got it, fellas? Yeah? Good. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So now that I understand this from an intellectual and rational standpoint, I'm come, I have come to the conclusion that since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unlimited, then everything that is in this world is with a purpose, that Allah would not oppress me at all. Right? Why? Because He's all perfect. Rather, oppression will come from me because I was disobedient to Him. I did not make the right choices in this world. I chose to cram for my exam. Right? I chose not to study at all for my exam. I chose to goof off. Right? During this life. So what ends up happening? I will get goofy results at the end. Right? Or results that won't make me smile and be happy anymore, right? If I spend all my time on my Xbox One or my 360 or my Wii, right? Or I spend all night, you know, checking everybody's profile on Facebook and next thing you know it's 2.30 a.m. or 3.30 a.m., right? And I have an exam the next day and I'm wondering why I can't see the questions straight, right? Then that's why, because I goofed off, right? And the results will be what? They will reflect, they will reflect my effort.
My results will reflect my effort in this world, right? Okay, so now let's take a look at the second point. The second point we said is, what do the halls of academia teach us about, about struggle? Now, social psychologists such as a woman by the name of uh, Mary Cuddy, she has a good book called Presence, good read. Anybody who's interested in, in reading a good book in social psychology that deals with struggle and other things, that's a very good book to read. The reason why is because she's collected a lot of studies. Now, she is, she's actually taught at Harvard and she's a PhD in social psychology. And I just want to cite you know, a couple of studies. One study is a very important one. And, and uh, that's one that was done to actually test how people perform under stress. So what they did was they brought a, a group of examiners. They basically trained them that when you test these two groups that we're going to bring to you, we want you not to smile, not to affirm whether they were correct or, um, uh, or wrong in answering the questions. And we want to make sure that you stress them. So if you ask them a question, if they don't answer quickly, then tell them, I need the answer now. I need the answer now. Do you not know the answer? I need the answer now. So they stress them, right? So the goal was to create a very stressful environment. So then what happens? They bring two groups. The first group, they prime them before they enter the study. How do they prime them? Meaning that they prep them. How do they prep them? By saying positive things to them. You can do it. You can handle whatever comes your way. You know, you're powerful. You're great. You're a good person. You know, um, uh, li uh, life isn't about what you go through now. It's about what comes after, right? All these positive affirmations. And then the second group, they didn't do anything to them. They didn't prime them at all, right? So they come in to these tests, they test them. What are the results? Those who had positive affirmations passed the tests, right? Those who didn't have any affirmation at all, right? Took whatever responses they received from the examiners as what? As negative. And they got stressed and they failed. When asked, why is it that you were able to be successful? The first group said, we were successful because we knew we could handle whatever comes our way. That's what they told us before we went into the test. And so that was the mindset that we had. The second group, they said, well, you know, we just felt that every question we answered wrong, we focused so much on that question that we got wrong that we couldn't really get over it. So when we went to the next one, we felt so stressed that we just couldn't think straight. And so they failed. Sounds familiar? <laughs> right? So... Another interesting um, study that she mentions is her, the, the author, her name is Mary Cuddy. The book, the book is called Presence. In her, the fifth chapter, she mentions um, power versus powerlessness, right? And the, she cites a study that also occurred that had a similar test. But what's interesting is the results of feeling powerful when you know something versus being powerless when you don't know something, right? So for example, why did those individuals within the test do badly because they didn't have any positive affirmation? They focused so much on what they did wrong, they forgot, they became heedless of the fact that this test is going to end, so they couldn't think positively. So they just kept on thinking about what was wrong over and over and over and over. And so they were left in kind of this cocoon where they lived within this negative environment where all they could think about is the bad things as opposed to the good things. And the bad things that they thought of is how much of a failure they were, how stupid they were, how they couldn't answer that question, and they'll never be able to answer any question after it. But what they teach us in tests, if you remember, our teachers, is they say, if you can't answer a question, skip it and go to the next one, right? But it's sometimes so hard to do. Why? Because you're so focused on your, fa your failure. You have to think about the positivity, right? Right? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Okay, so I'll, I'll, with the social psychology, that's enough, I think. So, so you get the idea. So social psychologists then say, that in order for you to deal with stress, the solution is that what you must do is have positive affirmation in your life. Very good? Okay. Let's take a look at the Islamic perspective now. And I want to go back to that verse, right? So Allah says, and surely we will, Allah emphasizes twice with the Lamb of Tawqeed and the Noon of Tawqeed. 
He says, surely we will test you and we will try you in this world. With what you may ask, uh, God doesn't leave it to chances. He tells you exactly what he's going to test you with. He says, Bishayin, he says, with some fear, shame and khawf, and hunger, you'll feel hunger, right? Wanaqsin, and you'll feel deficiency. Oh, in what shall we have deficiency, O oh Lord, right? Binaqsin min al amwal, with wealth, oh my heart. The biggest heart is the wallet, right? Binaqsin, <laughs> with what then? With wealth. I'm going to feel deficiency in wealth. Oh my goodness, so I'm going to feel poverty at one point in my life? Yes. You will feel that at one point of your life, right? Don't be surprised. God tells you that that will happen, right? When you know that something's going to happen, there are no surprises, right? If you come along and you say, oh my goodness, you know, I lost my home. I, because we know when we went through the financial crisis, so many people says, we don't know where the, economic, where the economic downturn came from. We lost our homes. People took their own lives during that time, right? Why? Because they couldn't look beyond the struggle, right? All they saw was now, what they were going through now, their failure now, their loss now, right? So, Allah, what does He say? He says, وَنَقْصٍ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ And the deficiency in your wealth, in your health, and in your prosperity, right? So three things you're going to be tested in, plus fear, and what? And hunger, okay? So how many things so far? Five things. So don't be surprised if you get hit in any of these five areas, right? And then what does he say? Then we say, wow, all of this, what do I do? Allah says, وَبَشَّرَ sabri." He says, listen, don't be pessimistic. Be optimistic, okay? I want to tell you, be happy if you're what? If you're patient. Got it, Allah says, be patient. Say, like, how am I going to be patient? I don't know how to be patient. Oh, God, tell me how to be patient. Right? What does he say? He says, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ He says, if you want to be patient, then remind yourself. Surely, you are from God, and to He you shall return. Now, why is this an important concept in order for me to be patient? Because it teaches me three things. One, that this world is not the be-all and end-all. Right? There's an end to the test. There's an end to the trial. There's an end to the struggle, right? So if I'm from my Lord and to He I shall return, that means that, you know what? This struggle will end. This life will end just like the struggle will end. There will be other struggles like it. It's no big deal, right? The second thing that this specific part of the verse teaches me is when I say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, I've connected with my Lord. I've realized I'm limited and if I want Unlimited success, then I have to connect myself with an unlimited source of success. It's exactly like if I want to be a great basketball player, right? Who should, who should I play with? Someone who's better than me, right? If I want to be a great soccer player, I have to play with someone who's better than me. If I want to be academically successful, then I should be studying with people who are academically successful. If I want to be better, then I need to... You know, have tutors who are better than me, have great teachers, right? If I want to learn and memorize Quran, then I should have a great reciter who can teach me, right? Got it? If I have someone who's lesser than me or someone who's the same as me, then I'm not going to improve. So Allah says, listen, connect yourself with the ultimate source of energy and power, and that is Allah the unlimited, me. Thirdly, what this part of the verse teaches me, other than the fact that my struggle is unlimited and that, you know, um, if I want unlimited power and limited success, then I should seek it from Allah Almighty. But also it teaches me something very important. The last thing. And that is, and that is, you, fo fo you focusing? This is very important. You focusing? Because I hear a lot of talking back and forth. You focusing? The third and most important thing that it teaches me is the fact that there will be a reward after all of this. Right? There will be a reward after all of this. It's not for nothing. I'm not here without purpose. If Allah is unlimited, then He does everything for a purpose. If Allah brought me to this world and I realize that if my child does something good, then I will reward him, then of course by priority Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward me if I do well. Right? That there is an ultimate reward that is better than anything in this world in which I have experienced loss. 
Got it? And Allah says in another verse, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُكَلِّفُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا Allah does not burden a soul with more than it can handle the same positive affirmation that got those test subjects through that test. Right? You can handle whatever comes your way. So what does Allah say? You can handle whatever comes your way. Why? Because I am unlimited. I am all perfect. I will not burden you with more than what you can handle. Otherwise, it would be oppression. And Allah is perfect. He doesn't. What? Khudr. He doesn't oppress. Right? You got it? So now I've understood rationally how to deal with struggle. Academically, what I can learn about struggle. Right? And Quranically, what Allah expects of me. If I do all of this, what does Allah tell me? He says, if you become of those people who are sabirin, those who say, surely we are from Allah and to He we shall return. And you adhere to these three points from inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Then what's going to happen? Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مَّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ Allah says, those are the ones upon whom Allah bestows His praise, the ultimate reward. And His mercy. Right? And those are the ones who are known to be and will be labeled as the righteously guided. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُهْتَدُونَ Imam Al-Hujjah Ajallah Ta'ala Faraja He is known as Al-Mahdi Mahdiyu هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ The Prophet says He is the guide to this nation The Prophet says Right? Those who know Arabic Right? Understand that if I'm Muhtadi Then I'm following the Mahdi if I'm righteously guided, then I'm righteously guided by the guide himself, the Mahdi. My source of guidance becomes whom? The Mahdi. So the most patient one is an Imam al-Hajjah, the Mahdi. And what is, what is he patient for? And what is the biggest struggle that he's going through? Waiting for us to realize how to be patient. Waiting for us to realize the value of our struggles. Waiting for us to realize how to navigate and negotiate the struggles that we go through. So when I begin this week, right? Any struggle that I face now, am I well prepared? Am I well prepared? At the very least with positive affirmations reminding me that I can handle the struggle, right? That I'm doing it for a purpose and this struggle came to me for a purpose so that I become a better, stronger individual. Every struggle comes for us to become stronger. Let me ask you a question. Charcoal, everybody knows charcoal, right? Right, coal, charcoal. If you hold it in your hand and you squeeze it real hard, will, will you crush it? Right, you'll crush it, right? Take a diamond. If you take a diamond and you try to squeeze it hard, can you ever break it? Diamonds are used to cut through mountains to create tunnels. Right? Am I right for those engineers? Right? Diamonds cut through glass. Right? They're both made out of carbon. What's the difference? What's the difference between the two? Diamonds are found at the bottom and inside mountains. You know what has made them so strong? Pressure. Pressure! And it's after the pressure that you got such beautiful results. You become strong after struggle. You become resilient after struggle. You can cut through anything after struggle. Right? So, when you, check, when you begin this week, what are you going to say? You're going to say, bring on the struggle. Right? I can handle the struggle. This struggle is going to make me better and stronger because it comes from Allah, the unlimited, right? Bring on the trials, bring on the struggle, bring on the pain because I can handle it. Because it's limited. It will end and I will be a better person for it and I will be more righteously guided. Because you know what? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Surely we are from Allah and to He we shall return. 
والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين